evening, my gorgeous Veilers. This is your November 2020 overview. Aries, you like to do things on your own and that way you know it's been done right. But this month you'll have to collaborate and trust those with whom you'll be paired up with. Taurus, this month is going to bring the mother of all showdowns. And my God, you better be ready for a verbal battle royale. You'll win, you'd fucking better, as it's your reputation on the line. Gemini, take a good hard look at your eating habits, your exercise routines, meditation devotions, everything. It's time to transform your physical world to bring it into alignment with your spiritual world. They both exist and they both need your attention this month. Cancer, we know you don't like to feel confined or play to other people's rules, so be it. But this month, you'll have to bite your tongue and behave as there are other people's opinions that you'll need to consider. Leo, my lovable Leos, you may find this month that you just want to stay home and nurture yourself with books, movies, good food, and even taking little naps to recharge your batteries. Do this. Nurturing you is healthy. Virgo, when you focus on the little things too much, you can sometimes miss the joys of life. What I can tell you is this. You've got all the details correct. There is nothing amiss. Now, go and enjoy this month. Libra, you can actually sit back and chill this month. You've worked hard and now it's time to reflect and appreciate everything that has happened and everything finally coming in. Well done, my lovely Librans. Scorpio, this is definitely your month to completely transform and heal thyself. It's time to become reborn into whom you want to be for the rest of your life. It'll be a very intense month for you and you'll finally say what you've wanted to for some time and not hold back it will surprise you Sagittarius you'll have some questions that demand answers and you simply won't get the truth you will find your dream time unlocks the mysteries that are hanging around and it'll help you realize that you may never get the truth and you won't care you will simply move on Capricorn, set hardcore boundaries around the people you know and watch those that don't respect you fall away. Let them fall, I say. You will finally have it confirmed with whom you can and can't trust. Aquarius, it's all about your career this month and you love being unique and original and this will shine all month. There are numerous projects to get involved in. Ensure you check all the details before committing. And lastly, Pisces. You are among three star signs this month that are all about transforming and reinventing yourselves. You can do this, it's not that scary. It's just time for you to remember who you are and remember that you can change things up whenever you want. This month, it's time to make inroads into that. Alrighty, my beautiful, gorgeous Veilers. That was your overview for November 2020. Be sure to check my pages beyond the veil for your daily intuitive dose and get in contact if you would like a session, psychic mediumship session or an astrology chart completed. There you go. I love taking you gorgeous Veilers beyond the veil and love, there's nothing but. This is the word to go, yo. go, go. <laughs> Well, well, well. <laughs> Welcome to Ga TV's Halloween Spooktacular. We've already sort of revealed our celebrity guest that's about to be here right with us. But as you can see, we are the three females of Foley. Mickey, you said it's like the three faces of Foley, right? Kind of the same, but you yeah. know, our own spin, if you will. Yeah. In case you can't <laughs> recognize us. It's so Cal Val playing the part of Cactus Jack. Mickey James playing the part of Dude Love. Ow, looking groovy. I have mercy. <laughs> and Lisa Marie is mankind. You know, if they if if heaven had a ladder, I'd climb up to heaven and drop an elbow on the whole world. 
Aww. That's a we quote. love That's that. A quote. That's a Mick Foley quote. We love it. <laughs> and Mr. Sacco's here too. Oh. And then, and also too, I even did, I went the whole nine yards. I painted out my ear. My <laughs> left ear is torn off from this. You're such there. a method actor. And look at those toofs. <laughs> <laughs> And that's eyebrow gel, which is probably not healthy, and I'm probably going to go into a seizure at the end. Well, hey, you know, poisoning for a good cause. We actually have a lot of uh, reason to celebrate good causes, and you'll hear that about the end of the episode. But if you're just joining us for the first time, welcome to Gaw TV. That's a hashtag, hashtag Gaw TV. We are so thrilled that it's almost Halloween, and we are beyond thrilled to have our most legendary. We've had some great guests, you guys, but this is the most legendary guest we've ever had. In case you didn't guess it already, ladies and gentlemen, we have Mick Foley here with us tonight. Woo woo! Woo! Yes. The <laughs> so nicest excited. guy in the business. The nicest guy in the business. That's right. Oh, I'm That's so right. excited for this. All right, so Come let's on. get him in here. Mick Foley, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome. Hello, hello. <laughs> you look great. Let me try to put this on a book or something, all right? Woo woo! There we go. How are you, Mick Foley? Everything is great. Are you in England? I am in England. And guess what? Foley translates all the way across the pond. We did tell you that we had Halloween costumes planned, but we didn't tell you that we had a little bit of a surprise. So um, are you making up the three faces here? We might be. Ah, that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh my goodness, look <laughs> Is that Mickey James? It is. This is me. You're my you main look, mandible. <laughs> she forgot looking, to shave. I did, but I parted it. Uh, that would be dude love if he was part Wolfman, I think. <laughs> I should have trimmed it a little bit. <laughs> it's it the looks, best beard I could find, Mick. I think look you at did my hand paint. Look, I hand wow. painted this. You hand painted that? I sure did. That looks incredible. Thanks. I did this just for you. We did this just for you. I hand painted, well, because I tried to order one and it got sent back. I never got it. So then I'm like down to the wire. I'm going, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So I painted it. Well, it's very, it looks great. You're obviously a talented artist. <laughs> what can't she do, right? We, we've got we've got Lisa Marie Varen, so we're in all parts of the world. Mick, are you in New York right now? Where are you? I'm in New York. Um, uh, I've got one week left in this house, and then I move in. I, we, I join the family in Florida. So we sold the house. Uh, you know, cleaning a house yeah, is always difficult, right? It's so a little bit sweet, right? Right. So, um, so <laughs> looking at the Paper. And I'm like, yeah, that was my wife's choice. So, uh, but I'm really glad because the couple that uh, buy the house, they really love it. Mm -hmm. And that was a really important to me as opposed to other couples who would like come over and they complain about, uh, you know, one, we had an offer. We've got this beautiful river that runs in the back of our, or front of our house. And uh, the couple was upset when they found out that it wasn't always high tide. And I was like, well, that's kind of how this works, you know? And so then they'd come back with an offer that I thought was ridiculously low. And I'd have to say, I think that's insulting. And then this couple came along, they loved the house. And I'm just trying to make it as great as I can for them. That's Fantastic. Awesome. We're, we're trying to get our, our Lisa Marie Baron. We're not going to spoil the surprise of who she might be. But if you put two and two together, uh, you know. All right, I'm ready now. He's ready. Wait, All right, no. Lisa Marie. <laughs> get ready. Are you ready? Let's wait till Mick sits down. Stay down. He's so excited. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that commitment. I don't with the teeth, too, huh? No, uh, you'll appreciate this. My left ear is gone. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, wear reading glasses. That's how hardcore I am. <laughs> Remember that quote? And in Mick, if heaven had a ladder, I climb up a to heaven and drop an elbow on the whole entire world. That's oh. rather early. That was like a 1990 quote. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome for studying. <laughs> She's kicking it old school. Well, Mick Foley, we old all school. collectively love you. We are so, so thrilled that you're here. And it is our honor to do the three females of Foley, three faces of Foley, because 
we got to tell you, we were trying to come up with Halloween themes. We've always wanted to have you on the show, but we said, okay, so we should we be like, you know, what's, it's all boring stuff, isn't it? Princesses or, you know, skeletons or witches or whatever. And <laughs> we said, okay, maybe something, you know, to, to cater to our, our, our wrestling friends that love wrestling, maybe some legendary wrestlers. Well, who's more legendary than you, my friend? So we thought three faces of Foley, three ladies here. So we hope you enjoy. I do. Yeah. I'm so surprised by it. I knew it was your Halloween. <laughs> spectacular <laughs> length you would go to to make it this special for me oh we, were we, so could, happy. we could not wait Mick. we were it was like don't i was like do not will you text him or email him don't tell him what we're doing let it be a surprise let it be a surprise and i thought someone like one of us would accidentally say you can't miss it it's really like, <laughs> yeah. dedicated to you mick you know but um we are so excited oh my gosh so excited now, lisa can i ask about the mankind mask yes it, where did I looks, get it? Yeah, it looks incredible. It's, it's. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you, Mick. I don't know how you did this. I'm, I'm dripping sweat. It's dripping on my desk right now. The sweat. She and I like even, I painted a beard on, which was unnecessary <laughs> in this mask. But I told, I asked the girls, do I have to keep this mask on the entire time? It's rubber. It's uh, rubber. And I have it. No, I got, look at, can I show you? I don't want to plug sure. any companies, but yeah. um, this, you are a freaking, look, look at, let me turn off my light. Wow. So they, they sell, sell that doors? I hope you're getting royalties from that. <laughs> I believe I do, but even <laughs> not, I think I do. But it's yeah. still just flattering that people would want to be me 20 years after I last portrayed that character in the ring. That's uh, yeah, yeah I, I think I think you know I get the quarterly check like we all do, uh, and one big nod to WWE. This is back when we were all in uh, TNA together, and I got my I uh, received my quarterly check, and my son Dewey, he was like seventeen or eighteen at the time. He was like, "You still get a check from WWE?" And he said, "Dad, Dad, like what items would they have of yours to sell?" And I opened up the thing, and there's literally hundreds of items, and not yeah. enough. TNA at all, but they just never had the marketing machine that WWE did. So even when I was a current TNA wrestler, my my royalty check would consist of like 12 items. And here's the company I no longer work for, but they've got a hundred things out there. So that's right. really fun. I did not know that you could just go to the store and be mankind. The reason I asked about the mask is because uh, when I do my cameo videos, I'll occasionally slide into not mankind, but man and a mankind mask because i don't own the uh copyright to that one name i got two out of three. Oh, and really you don't know what mankind are we allowed to say mankind on here yeah, yeah, of course you are i mean I just, well, womankind you know, really if you think about it womankind. Okay, woman, womankind womankind Take love. <laughs> you're wearing officially the wwe product uh you know yeah. going back to when i was with tna it was when I got on uh, social media, right? 2009, I think is when I got on. And the, the, the dirty word people would use with relevant, like, oh, still trying to be relevant, relevant, relevant. And you know, that kind of stuff stings a little bit if you it let does. it. And, yeah. yeah. And I'd say within a year of all that relevant stuff, I started seeing the appearance of my characters for Halloween especially mankind, but cactus to some extent, dude love. And then I was like, oh, I'm not washed up. I'm part of people's childhoods. Yeah, you like, are, you right. are. And it, you know, I mean, when we, like, when we, we do comic cons and or wizard worlds and stuff like that, when I see someone dressed as mankind or like characters that we know or Jake the snake or something like that, I'm like, excuse me, sir, sir. Instead of them having to just pay for a picture with me, I'm like, you can I take a picture with you? Please, yeah. can I take a picture totally. with you? Yeah. I love it. Even if it's even if it's not me, if it's someone dressing up as the macho man, whatever the case yeah. may be, the holster. Sometimes you'll see five, six people all with NWO costumes or DX. Yeah. And it's so cool. It's one of the things I really miss during this COVID craziness, right? Uh, we can't do the conventions because we get to see those super fans. And it's like, you know, you can I remember taking my my youngest son. And, and Noel, this is maybe six, seven years ago to a convention on Long Island. And he was like, Dad, um, you know, am I going to feel foolish? He wanted to be Captain America. I was like, buddy, if there's one time you don't feel foolish, oh. 
You're a superstar. You're if you dress exactly. up, you're the superstar. That's why I love them. You know, everyone's accepted. It's 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 a fun, safe environment. Like I was a weird kid. I weird by by some people's standards. Always dressing up. Always playing pretend. And then I kind of found my people at Comic Cons and people that love certain genres like that. But the, yeah, but Mick, honestly, like when we talked about that's how the idea how the idea came about. We were talking about legendary, world renowned, globally recognizable characters like I thought okay maybe I'll be Hope with Hulk Hogan with the blonde hair so then we said oh my god we could each be Mick Foley and that's how this came about and we've sort of like feminized it so I guess it would be like womankind Mickey you said chick love and I'd be like a cactus Jacqueline perhaps (laughs) (laughs) brilliant that's brilliant (laughs) brilliant I love it Oh well, we God. have to ask you, Mick, how, how has lockdown been treating you? I mean, I, you know, it's, it's a weird time. They're doing some virtual events and things like that, but how you been holding up? Yeah, I've been doing okay. Uh, it really hit me, you know, in the beginning, partially because I was like, there's got to be something I could be doing. Uh, there's no way of, you know, helping, right? We had our great frontline workers, essential workers, and I'm just sitting at my house I had gone out on the road and done, a, uh, I think, four shows in Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and even sent out a message saying, hey, I know that there's talk about this virus, but I, I am intending to do all my shows. And it was like 30, 30 shows that I had lined up. And by the third night, it was clear that this was going to be a real, you know, much worse than we thought. Yeah. Um, and so I canceled the whole tour, and now I'm sitting home. I'm not only sitting home, but my wife has a pre-existing condition. So I can't go home and I'm just sitting there. Uh, and so at the time I did, uh, I committed to doing a thousand free video messages uh, for fans, just mm-hmm. something to make them smile. And uh, I remember a few people saying, why don't you just do Cameo and donate the money? I was like, well, this is more about giving somebody, people something for free as opposed to charging money and then you know giving it to a good organization. But I am, I'm really fortunate. This cameo stuff, I started doing it in May, in May. And I love it because not only is it for the first time, believe it or not, I never had any way of making money that didn't involve me traveling. And so I was looking at $0 for the foreseeable future. And the money's good. But I, do, I do enjoy making money while sitting at home. But I, but I get to perform on these videos. You know, like I, I break out the characters. Today I did a, uh, there was a guy from Australia, so uh, we call the Land of Oz, you know, the people in Australia call the Land of Oz. So I did a, not a rap battle, but a singing battle between Dude Love, <laughs> who sang, you know, the merry old Land of Oz, ha ha ho, ow, ho, 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 <laughs> and, and oh, Lisa, you look crazy with those teeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what? Okay, Mick, I put, on my eyebrow gel on my teeth, and I'm I'm a little concerned I'm gonna have a, a seizure after this interview. She might have lead poisoning. It, it wasn't oh, no. probably meant for my teeth, but <laughs> um, you pop me at ha 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 ho ho ho, <laughs> and then we cover up la la la. With man we dance the day away in the merry old land of Oz. Yeah, that's my favorite. That's my favorite movie. But mankind took it with a very sensitive rendition of Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and. <laughs> So, you know, in no way, shape, or form am I getting people going, hey, can you do sing-alongs with Dude Love, singing battles? But I get to, you know, I get that feeling of creating something, and that's something I think we all love doing in wrestling. Uh, And so that has really been helpful. And now Mickey James might attest that I have a hobby where I, I, you know, you don't have many children watching the show, do you? No. No. So just read between the lines here. I uh, am an official ambassador for the big guy in red. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you do the math, Santa doesn't have time to write to every child on the face of the earth. And so I cover some of the letter writing and I love doing it. Yeah. I'm I so glad it. you brought this up. Well, watch Mickey, what Mickey has. <laughs> Perfect segue. I blocked my address off of here, but these are letters from Santa to Mr. Donovan. I actually, we're going to show pictures of these, Mick, up, like where you can see where the calligraphy. It's <laughs> beautiful. You it's did so calligraphy? Uh-huh. You know, what? when I had my, it is a, the key thing here is you have to, children have to be able to read it. So it can't be so fancy. Oh, it's got the seal. Oh, and the wax seal. 
Oh, I <laughs> just I can't. And this one, remember this one? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. And this one had yeah. the um, official <laughs> nice list. Next year, you'll get that letter. So. The nice list. Oh, oh my God! Look how oh, you know wow. what I said. This will stay with people into adulthood. Like those are serious, serious memories you're creating. How wonderful! I'm gonna keep this forever. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick, you are goes, amazing. You're thanks. so. You are amazing. You're amazing. So that goes back to what we all tried to accomplish in the ring. Is you, you know, the best compliment about a match is that you create a memory that people will recall you know, years, years from now, decades from now. And so I, I tried to do that uh, to some extent with the cameos and then uh, with, the, with the, so I'll show you what I, hold on one second. I'll, so. Oh, we got an exclusive coming up. Uh -oh. Is he wearing a, is he wearing a brother love shirt right now? A tie dye shirt, he's wearing a tie dye shirt. Oh, he always wears tie dye shirts, Lisa. We so love these, it, these, not these, all the time. 10 letters last night. And uh, so they're all individually handwritten. Oh my and, God, you uh, write them yourself? Yeah, yeah, do everything myself. When I had my hip and re knee replaced in 2017, um, I don't know if you know the name Jill Thompson. Jill's an amazing artist. She did a couple of my children's books. She did the artwork for that amazing CM Punk shirt that was really uh, popular, an illustration uh -huh. of Punk that was a big seller for WWE. And uh, so she did this, she, if Mickey showed you the first page, it's Santa holding a fountain pen and he's uh, writing on a tablet. So I thought, okay, I can't use a computer font for this. Like I've got to be able to write the letters. Yeah. And my children couldn't read my writing. And I thought, ooh, that's, that's a little wrench in the work. So when I had my hip replaced April, 2017, and then followed up with the knee replacement in September, 2017, I just spent hours, like three, four hours every day working on my writing. So my wife wow. thought, I, wow. yeah, yeah. I thought that was a pretty good uh, project. That. Uh, wow, that's intense. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's beautiful too. It's it is beautiful. Is, like, that is a really, I, use, I, had a, I have a pen and then when you try to write, it doesn't, you, you automatically think it's gonna automatically write like that. It doesn't write yeah. like that. You have, no, to, you have to know how to, how to yeah. yeah. Very you have to work it. It's like anything, you know, the better you, you, you uh, the more exactly. you work at it, the better you yeah. get. And so my wife thought I was going through a midlife crisis because she would wake up and there'd be like lyrics from love songs written all over the house. <laughs> and I was just working on it every night. And right. uh, to the point where I was like, I'll know when it looks like Santa's. Like, I'll know it when I see it. So uh, I get a little writing envy, like on the Christmas Chronicles with Kurt Russell as the uh, Santa. He's got a beautiful, it's not, I doubt it's his writing, but a beautiful cursive. Mine's right. uh, printing, and I was like, "Oh, that looks better than mine." Uh, Damn yeah. you, Kurt yeah. Russell! I know, I know. Pardon I know. Kurt Russell. <laughs> penmanship well, heat. The pe penmanship heat. That's right. Well, we know that you are so charitable. Obviously, we love you for so many reasons for being, as as Lisa said before you came on, the nicest person in wrestling, bar none. But we um, know that you are always so wonderful to to donate your time and and money and and resources to charities. So there was a method to our madness with making sure that we all had these head to toe Mick Foley costumes, the three females of Foley. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna auction off every single one of our outfits. I'm talking weapons. I know everyone wants this bad boy, this uh, Wayne's World style. Uh, <laughs> everything you see here, we're going to put off all the links. We're going to donate everything to charity, a charity of your choice, Mick. All three of yeah. us are going to do that. So we'll have the info well, too. You. Yeah, and would, uh, the one I'd like to choose, because I talked with you guys a little bit about this in our emails, uh, Christmas Magic is a group that I've uh, volunteered for for 20 years. Yeah. And what they do is... Uh, they help make the magic of Christmas morning possible for children on Long Island living in homeless shelters or transitional housing, foster homes or sober houses or things like that. And I've been, I've been in the red uh, suit for them since 2014. What? Uh, I, that long? They, they, yeah, yeah, since 2014, wow. the first year I did, I, I we represented them in the chair. And I wrote about it at one point. I said it was like the uh, the guy who founded it. He's a great guy. He's an attorney. And every November, December, they turn the whole law offices into like a North Pole where uh, people deliver presents. They wrap presents. 
That's and amazing. he had rotator cuff surgery and asked me if I would take over his duties. And I felt like I was being called in from the bullpen, like to pitch the ninth <laughs> of the World Series. <laughs> yeah. but, but this year, because of COVID, they, they can't do any uh, in-person visits. Oh. And I know a lot of people are going to be struggling this year financially. So if uh, you auction off those items, it will go to a great cause. And that's where my... Yeah. Uh, percentage of my November cameos will go to Christmas magic as well. Fantastic. Okay. You got we, it. We tried to be you very intricate. It. We wanted to, to, we thought about all the auction items and what was going to sell. I even went as far as to get the leopard print boots. I thought what? I can't be, it's like a female version, but it's, I can't be Cactus Jack without the leopard print boots. Oh yeah. She's got the dude. <laughs> okay. Don't ask me because I couldn't find brown pants anywhere. <laughs> I, bought, I have brown shorts. Oh, she made it trendy. But I tried to put some wrestling boots on, but you know, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Can I tell you a quick, a quick uh, wardrobe story? It's not yes. a malfunction. It's a cute a little story. You may know yeah, yeah. that I'm an, um, challenged fashion. I'm fashion challenged, right? So, <laughs> no. uh, so going back to 1990, uh, 1999, Stephanie McMahon was in marketing at that time. She was an on-air character, but she was in she was in the New York marketing office. Mm -hmm. She wasn't in Connecticut. Like you know, Vince was really big on uh, the children starting on the ground and we're working their way up. And so Stephanie was going to be hosting an event at the uh, Boardwalk Resort at Walt Disney World, and I was supposed to dress you know uh, business <laughs> business casual. I guess <laughs> the problem is. I either had flannel shirts and t-shirts <laughs> or one tuxedo, right? So I yeah, which up. way are you gonna go here? It's like ah <laughs> Right. So I show up to this event, it's 105 degrees outside in Orlando, Florida. You know, we all know how hot it can get, right? It's yeah, brutal. Yeah. And I'm wearing a tuxedo and I'm just pouring sweat. And Stephanie is keeps telling me, Mick, you don't have to wear that. You know, I said. Ah, uh, you know, I don't know, Steph. I, you know, and she goes, Mick, please. I'm asking you, please take off that jacket. I was like, Are you sure? And she said, Yes, I'm sure. So I take off the jacket, and the only dress shirt I had was a mankind dress shirt. So it's all jagged. It's got the sleeves torn off. And she was like, uh, Maybe you should put that jacket back on. So uh, <laughs> taking a look at your shirt made me realize, Yeah, that was the. Uh, <laughs> So easy. I now when I need to be dressed up, I just show up with that. That's a that's a very commendable, high quality, high quality uh, mankind outfit. Yes, yeah, it is. You know, but 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 I always wondered, like when we did these appearances, I don't know if people, the fans want to see us dressed normal. I still feel like they need to see us dressed a little bit more in our character a little bit. Right. So I always was like uncomfortable with the business cast. Because I don't wear heels. I don't wear a dress. That's just not me in real life or my character. And so when I would dress like that, I just was so uncomfortable. And I'm like, my God, this is not me in real life or my, like, I was just trying to portray this pretty ass diva. You know what I mean? Right. So I was always uncomfortable, you know, very uncomfortable with that. That's and, I'm a always sweater. and I'm a sweater too. <laughs> sweater. I'm a sweater. <laughs> That's always a decision people have to make when they do conventions or whatnot. I know that some people say, people, Sting, for example, he's always in a full makeup, but he's only there for a couple hours at a time. Mm -hmm. Any of you have, have slogged it out, you know, sometimes you're spending 24 hours, eight hours a day. Uh, and I know there's that famous Virgil, lonely Virgil photo. You know the one I'm talking about? There's like also the a website, lonelybirds.com. In, oh, yeah. in the subway? In the subway? In the subway? No, this one's not in the subway. Oh, although oh, okay, he okay. has a shop at a, at a subway, I believe. Um, but the thing is, uh, that's a funny photo. But if you're spent, and I get tip my hat to WWE because they never put their superstars in a position where they look like anything but superstars. Right. So that's why you only do two hour appearances. It's always well. Um, promoted it's always a non-stop line but you don't get to make the connections you know like one of the things i'm lucky is uh for example you know i have a i wear my autism acceptance bracelet because i have a son who's on the spectrum right 
And yeah. so I've gotten pretty good at identifying children or even adults who need a little extra time. <clears throat> and you can give them that extra time at these conventions in a way that you can't when it's just two hours, 250 people, bam, bam, bam. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 20 seconds tops. Right. Uh, but so the plus is that you do get to spend time with people. The minus right. is if someone wants to snag any of us without a line in a huge convention center, eventually we're all going to be there. Um, right. But uh, um, so the lonely Virgil photo is a little bit misleading because we've all been there. But I think uh, I think we miss it, right? I miss being uh, being at those things. Yeah. Oh, for sure, for sure. You mentioned um, ha having great memories of, you know, your... Wait, wait, can, can I interrupt about that, sure. though? Like, like I, I think, like, when we do, like, Wizard World and Comic-Con, uh, <coughs> like, when, Mick, Mick, when I, I've done some appearances with you, we're not there for j just two hours. We're there when it opens and That's what it, I'm closes yeah. and it closes. And, and we don't just... It's not a cattle call. We're like, next, 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 next. Sorry, you got to go, you got to go, you got to go. It's you get that contact and have that. I remember this, and then you see the spark in their eyes, and you kind of like you're just like, wow, I can't believe that this person remembers this match and not this match. Do you know what I mean? You're just like, wow, yeah. this is incredible. You know what I mean? And it's very humbling, very humbling. It's yeah. not yeah, it's really nice, and uh, that's why, like I said, for me, uh, I miss I miss that. I've only I flew uh, last week for the first time in seven months. I don't, I don't miss the traveling like I thought I would because when I got off the road in 2000, uh, got away from full-time wrestling, I really missed those road trips. That's what I, I, I missed the road trips and I missed seeing the children, you know, that would be doing the, uh, the wishes. And even though I was very rarely the wish, like I would always try to be part of, Hey, I would see somebody and say, Hey, can I, can I, uh, meet the child too? And WWE was always good about making, delivering more than they were, the child was promised. So they're promised to say when they're promised to meet John Cena, they probably meet 10 to 15, you know, uh, superstars. And so I did miss that. And that's when I started making a lot of phone calls, you know, to different organizations. And I remember uh, the American Cancer Society, they were like, yeah, you can volunteer, but you have to come to an eight hour workshop. And my wife said, oh, forget them. If there's, you know, other people that don't make you do anything. And I was like, you know, Anything worth doing is worth doing well. So I went to the eight-hour workshop, and uh, and I, I enjoyed it. And I had a relationship with uh, that group for several years where I was a volunteer. But I so I missed those events, and then I decided if I wasn't going to see the children, if they weren't going to be coming to us, that I would go to places and try to make a little bit of a difference. Yeah, and yeah. you certainly have. You certainly have. Yeah. That, you mentioned um, memories that you had. Uh, speaking of memories, Mickey, Lisa, and I, before the call started, we were talking about our favorite memories, matches as well, but our favorite memories with you. So I need to start with Mickey because she mentioned the Donovan um, Christmas letters, but she also had a, a certain memory. Was it at Six Flags, Mickey? Oh, well, oh. when I was in Louisville at OBW, uh, we would do the Six Flags over Louisville. The, what were the names? Lisa, do you remember that? Because I know that you were I remember Six too. Flags. Yeah, it was like on the Batman stage. And it was all black and they converted it into our entrance. It was amazing. The OVW did remarkable at that at that venue. Well, I remember so they would do their the summer series over there and Mick would come all the time and we I got to ride rides with you. That that was when I first got to truly know you, Mick. Yeah, that's right. I think my condition. What I did when I retired. Now what year was that? Do you remember? Two thousand three? Um, that had to have been two thousand three. Four, 2003, four, yeah. I, or I remember Corny was surprised. I lost all that weight to wrestle Randy Orton. I dropped about 60 pounds. Whoa. And I, yeah, at that time, I, I found it again. Don't worry. It was I found it. It. <laughs> <laughs> found it. <laughs> they, thanks to coronavirus. Thank you. Thank you for the weight. Uh, I don't have to do but snack. I <laughs> look at it. I have kept six to eight local restaurants in business uh, by my with my takeout orders, delivery orders. <laughs> But I made a list of about 10 people who I thought had helped me over the years. And then I committed to, uh, to uh, I would do a free show for each one of them to show my appreciation. So Courtney was on that list and then Skandor Akbar was on there and Harley Race and there were a handful of other people. So I told Jimmy, I was like, all right, I'll come in. You don't have to pay me, 
but I, I'm going to go on those rides. Like, you know, like you, and so he found Mickey James for me to, uh, we spent like three, four hours going on all the it different was, rides. Right. It was the best day ever. Cause I love, I equally love roller coasters. And then when he told me that I was like, Oh, he likes roller coasters and stuff. So I'm thinking, Oh, well, no, he doesn't want to do the super scary ones. He loves all of them. I did at that time. I could before the head injuries. Yeah. 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 Oh, I that can go on. Fun. That was the best day ever. Yeah. Is Mickey making that that tie dye bandana work or what? I know, I'm Ryan. Serious. serious. I might have, have to on keep TV it. as an homage, please. <laughs> I'm thinking I might have to keep the headband. I don't know if I want to auction this bad boy off. <laughs> it might just be the boots and the shirt, but it's a hand painted shirt, Mick. Yes. Look at the look at the look at the look at the face. Look at the face. It looks she incredible. Was up at, she was up until 2 a.m. painting that last night because she ordered your shirt, but it didn't come in. She goes, oh, my gosh, I have to go shop to make this. And Speaking that's my appreciation. Look at the Halloween shirt. Look how cool look this is. That. That's cool. Oh, that's really nice. Oh, I love it. Perfect. It's a button down. I just realized yeah, that's sure. fucking on the back of the shirt, the back of my chair. So why not do it? Hey, you know what? It's very business cash. We usually do a thing in the show in the beginning, and we forgot because we were so excited. We usually ask, who are you wearing? What are you drinking? But you've just done it for us. And obviously, you know what we're wearing, which will be available on yeah. eBay, on auction for everyone to go get, in, in, uh, all for a great cause. Now, Lisa, you have a, a Foley memory you wanted to share as well, yes? I have, I have, I have many. Um, but just recently, I remember we were at a convention um one like a comic-con or a wizard world and we found about found out like ashley macero passed away yeah yeah and, yeah and then he was like i want to be a part of this and they were like we're all going to be doing a charity together and then we i contacted lillian hey mick foley wants to be part of this too and how much you have extended like people don't really know i mean you're so giving and very you have a lot of passion and just a lot of, they don't realize how much you have done for other people than yourself. Right. You're very, you're, you're such a humbling, humble person and you have given to so many charities. Um, remember you, you said you were answering phones for rape victims and stuff like that in the past. And um, my, my, my memory is not just about wrestling. It's about the person who you are because the people don't, uh. You know, you, it is. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not yeah. kissing your butt or anything. It's like people don't realize that we're really human and we have a lot of feelings. And for us, I think wrestlers have extra amount of feelings. Like we're just super sensitive people. I think. And well, so I we think have a yeah. like, It's been said. Like you know, people will say, "Well, why does uh, someone? You know, uh, Bret Hart was. You know, he would always respond. Or he often respond to criticism." And then I, I used to for a, you know, a long time. And then people are like, why? Well, geez, why, why does he even bother? And what they don't realize is like, it's those things that made the same traits that make you sensitive to that were the same traits that made you successful. It was that level of caring. So you could say, okay, wipe away that whole issue of caring about what people say. All right, but if I do that, I never would have been who I was because it was that idea that you want to try to make every single person happy. And over time, you realize you can't. But if you didn't start out with that intention, I don't think any of us would be in a position where we're talking, uh, you know, just you know, talking on a, on, on a Zoom call right now. You know, the, going back to, uh, you know, when Ashley passed away, that, I mean, that, that was Virginia Beach where uh, I told you I wanted to get involved. Yeah. And, and if you, I don't know if you had the same trouble with your airline. There was uh, storms coming into Atlanta. Yeah. So I did. all the connections were, uh, were, were um, either delayed or canceled. And I had to be at Raw in Albany, New York uh, the next day. And I'm like, I can't, you know, I can't physically drive from Atlanta. I can physically drive from Virginia Beach. It's a 12 hour drive, but I'll make it. So, so I left and I drove that whole way. I got to raw. Now, usually, you know, being a Long Island guy, Albany, New York to Long Island, four hours, that's a piece of cake. <clears throat> but I was so worn out that uh, I, cr I had this pull over about an hour into that trip. And when I did, then I, I, I don't know if it was an email or what I saw. I saw that 
uh, Ashley's uh, funeral was no longer private. He, he, WWE, you know, they didn't want it to be a media, I mean, the Massaro family didn't want it to be a media circus. And I thought, okay, I, I should try to make this. And the next morning, my phone call came, you know, wake up call. I was like, oh, I'm so tired. I really need to sleep. Then I was like, uh, something went off in my head. I was like, no, if you don't make it to that funeral because you think you need an extra couple of hours, uh, it doesn't say much about you as a person. And so because I had met you, had seen you at the Comic-Con, because I had told you I want to get involved, then I was committed to going to her service. And that's how I got the chance to talk with her mom afterward. The, you know, it's not the crazy thing. The sad thing is, Ashley lived in the same town that I did, same small town in Long Island. And when I went over to her parents' house after the service, I was just thinking to myself, why haven't I been here 10 times? You know, like, why wasn't, why didn't I know that Ashley didn't like to drive? Why wasn't I checking with her to see what her indie dates were so I could give her a ride? And so I, I really, you know, when I, when I talked to Ashley's mom, she said, no, we're fine. You know, we don't want, you know, we're okay. And then I said, what if it was a college fund? And she thought about it and she nodded. She goes, I guess that would be okay. So I went home and I wrote letters to um, Ashley's mom and her daughter, Lexi. And then I printed out some really beautiful photos that have been taken at an appearance in 2006. And I brought them over to the, uh, to the family. And so when uh, uh, Ashley's mom was reading the letter, she said to um, her granddaughter, Ashley's daughter, Lexi, look here, Lexi. And it was the part about wanting to uh, do a college fund. And so, you know, Lexi, who I had not met until that earlier that day, she jumped up and she gave me a hug. So something that might, you know, might have never happened had I not run into you at that Comic-Con turned out to be a really good, uh, you know, I'm still in touch with uh, Lexi. You know, she and her uh, grandparents come over to the house, so we get together for lunch about once a month. So I just oh, that's you know, great! Wonderful. Uh, I didn't know that. That's awesome! Yeah. Oh my god! Um, she's got a new job at a, a restaurant in the in town, so I'm going to try to stop by there in the next couple of days. Um, but again, I don't. I mean, it's hard to use the word serendipitous when it reply. You know, in relation to somebody leaving us way too early. But I just thought, I don't know if that's a circumstance or if it's, uh, you know, fate. But one way or another, it turned out to be uh, where we all were able to make a big difference. And the family was so touched because it wasn't just a few people making big donations. It was like three or four thousand people. And I had already committed to no longer doing the yearly wanted uh, T-shirt sale. But we did it with we did it again with all proceeds going to uh, Lexi's college fund, and I knew what the sale had brought in in the past, and we probably doubled what I'd done in any other uh, year, just because people wanted they wanted to be part of that. And I think if you give people a reason, it you, we all know that when you just put out a hey here's a GoFundMe, it gets very little traction. Right. But it can make people feel the importance and make them feel like they're part of something. And I always feel like when you when it's the wrestling community pulling together and we're capable of doing some really great things as a as a group, whether it's being able to make a donation or just getting the word out, retweeting, uh, liking, you know, we're recommending. So uh, yeah, we're capable of great th capable of great things as a community. Right. It's so true. And and it seems like a, a small task retweeting or making a small donation, but it all adds up. And like you said, it's very it's very personal. I think the wrestling community is is, is like a little a family in a way and the girls mentioned their memories and mine is is charity 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 based as well in the sense that my foley memory was when you were in impact wrestling is when i got to finally meet you and obviously i've been a big fan and we had some really great conversations we we're always sitting weirdly enough on golf carts at the impact zone <laughs> out, so you remember this uh, you know, in, in between filming and whatever oops almost knocked the computer down in between filming and whatever, we would always just, you know, have these conversations. And it was funny because we would have these conversations about how we both love Tori Amos and how certain Tori Amos songs really inspired you and, you know, about your family and all these things. And it's funny because I probably never told you this, but maybe I did, but all the wrestlers, and I remember them specifically passing by and being like, I <laughs> what are they talking about? What's going on? What's going Always. on? Like, what are they? It was just you and I just, you know, talking, laughing. 
And uh, then the guys would come over to me at catering usually, and they would say things like, um, so, so, so what were you talking to Mick Foley about? Like, oh my God, like that's Mick Foley. What were you talking about? Did you pick his brain about wrestling? And I was like, um, oddly wrestling never came up. That's the last thing we're talking about. And I loved that I got to talk to you about, you know, things that were personal and, and all of the great work that you did because me being a huge fan for many years, I never knew all the stuff that you did. And as Lisa and Mickey said, it's because you're not somebody that's ostentatious that's going and saying, look at all I'm doing. It's something that you did, especially like your work with Rain for years. It was very, you know, undercover, which I really thought was very commendable because it was, you know, that meant that it wasn't, you know, it was from your heart. And I love yeah. that. Yeah. Memories. On, on the golf cart. Good old I, re I remember the golf cart. specific times on the golf cart, I read a chapter about meeting Tori Amos. Yes. Later was in the uh, Countdown to Lockdown book. It was uh, one of the favorite things I've ever written. So I think you read it when it was just on legal tablets. I did. And I look over at you and get tears running down your cheeks. I'm like, this is so beautiful. You remember? Of course. <laughs> and instances, I think where even Jim Rome, you know, the, the broadcaster, made fun of it for being too sentimental. But it doesn't have to connect with everybody out there, right? You know, yeah. like, it doesn't, you don't have to. You'd be much rather have... Uh, a portion of people loving something you did and, and another portion hating it as opposed to 100% of people going, eh, it was okay because none of us remember the things that were okay. We only remember. If you think about it, what were the two types of matches that created a sellout around the monitor? It was either a match that had the potential to be amazing or a match that had the potential of going terribly Fail. wrong. Right? Yes. <laughs> case, case in point, I see everyone gathered around the... Uh, uh, monitor in WWE. I was like, what's going on? I thought maybe it was going to be some five-star match. And uh, I think oh, cool. I turns around and says, uh, Midian's going to appear naked here in a few minutes. And it <laughs> was my favorite. I love that guy. <laughs> I love that. He he was, so I, nice. I yeah. love Midian. He, you know, you know, uh, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt the story. He reads a book a day. And he does? We used to exchange, we used to exchange um, our novels about horror um, books. And he goes, have you read this? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'll take it. He's finished with it. And I'll take his, and I'll give him a book. Interesting. Yeah, he would, yeah, he was amazing. Okay, go back about your story. About, you're well, like, what's, going, that, on? what's going on? Just indicative of, all right, this is going to be a disaster. And I'm going to counter saying, I love Naked Midian in the five to 10 second, you know, <laughs> clips. And even in the backstage promos. But when they had him do like 15 minutes on a TV, I was like, ah, oh, maybe this is too much of a weird thing, Why? you know? Mm. Because once you see that it's, he's not actually naked, but he's wearing flesh colored oh. trunk with a fanny yeah. pack, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And he's just running, he's running. Have you seen him lately? He has a big old eyeball tattoo on his head. Yes, it's and he's a chef in Tampa, right? I didn't know that. I he believe he's a He came to some of my early shows. Lovely guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's hilarious. He's hilarious. He was one of those guys who was uh, who could entertain you and make you laugh backstage, and then he would go on and be stoned, like, I'm going to be uh, Tex Slazinger. I'm going to be part, you know, I guess when he was Phineas Godwin, yeah, he had a character. And then later, but as Naked Midian, he was able to. Uh, uh, he, he, I couldn't uh, wait. I couldn't wait. When I saw him, like, Oh, you doing? Are you doing a run through? Oh my God! Okay, so I was glued on the screen. That's the highlight of Lisa's life. I could not. Days. I could not wait. I couldn't wait. I was like going, "Oh God!" Like, watch the crowd reaction. Watch, watch this. Watch this. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I you wish know, like he did bring that personality backstage on stage because he was so personable and so <laughs> funny backstage, right, Mick? Can I? Can I tell you one? Uh, a take that never saw the light of day it was it would have been one of the great personal triumphs of my career. We experimented, I think, with him being my assistant for a few weeks. All right, and so this is, I think, two thousand three. I might be getting commissioner my years. Holy days. But it, yes, it was this second my second run as commissioner, or, or I don't know. I was commissioner in two thousand, and I dabbled a little bit in two thousand one, two thousand three. Uh, but it's back in the days where it was still conceivable that you were using a pay phone, right? So it was before every, I mean, people had, everyone had a cell phone, but there were still pay phones. Uh -huh. And follow me, I said, hey, I need to make a call. Do you have a quarter? 
And he goes, yeah, it's right here in my fanny pack. And I reached back. I said, I just need one, not a whole roll. And he said, that's not my fanny pack. And I said, that's a wonderful line, right? And it never, never made. <laughs> why did it, it, was it, why did it like, like, we always push the limit. Why did it not make ever? Like, why did it wrestling in those days? Uh, I do. We did that get that pillow way. fights and lingerie matches. Why didn't that make ever? That was my, I told, I told Mick that before. I was such a diva fan. We talk about it on the show all the time, Mick. I'm like, I missed the, the satin robes and the, and the, the, the lingerie matches. I wanted to be uh, that. But what the women are doing is incredible now. It is. And, uh, yeah. It was so, you know what? It was so what a, what a testament to, to Mickey and Lisa that you guys were able to have such great matches in an era that didn't often afford you that chance. Yeah. Right. It was, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, from my, you know, well, one of the best stories I've heard, and I wasn't sure if this was Trish telling me the story or if it was you, Mickey, is that in the rumble, there was some mention of, of you and Trish, Mickey and Trish doing some kind of a stare down showdown. And John Lord, I said, oh, I don't think anybody's going to remember. And the moment you two locked up, everyone's got a Lord. That's an easy one, right? That's pretty good. Uh, as the moment you guys locked eyes, that entire arena came alive. Like, yes, they, like, I would, I would be thinking to myself, how dare you think they wouldn't remember? You know, you throw so much stuff out there. I've, I've some, I, in that countdown to lockdown book, I said, wrestling's almost like that sushi conveyor belt. You know, it's just constantly going around and you grab something and eat it, but you're very ha seldom have a choice to really enjoy it. And so it's rare when you find something that resonates with people to the point where they remember it 15, 20 years down the line. And it's, uh, that, was, that was just such an amazing and well-built angle. And, you know, really a testament to taking the time to make something right. Oh, thanks, Meg. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't know whether I told you that story or Trish. I was like, oh! I've never said, well, listen, I will say that we were never even supposed to be in the ring together. So it was almost like we had to fight to even be in the ring. I was going to get eliminated well before Trish ever yeah. came out. And I was like, I really feel like we're missing a really special moment of us being in the ring together, of us having this moment. And it was totally like kind of blase. It's like, I honestly don't think people are going to remember. Okay. And then it was like, okay, well, we'll give you two in the ring together. And so then we got in the ring together, but I'm like, okay, well, if we get in the ring together, but there's not, I'm just going to bump and feed when she comes in. And it's, there's not this, this moment. Right. Which is, I was like, well, that's the moment. So that I don't need to bump and feed. Why don't we just wait for this moment? You know how it goes. Yeah. yeah. Get into that. No, but I was like, I couldn't believe it. I could, I was like, Oh, I couldn't believe. And then it made me think for a second, go like, because we always want to believe that what we've done has meant something to a group of fans who hear it. And you, but I was like, I honestly felt like, okay, am I just being egotistic or like delusional that I think that this moment is going to be really special and that we're not capital. I know I get that you have to build other stories and make sure those stories get over. But I think that it's like, why would you miss out on something that is so special with the fans and a match that is so special to the fans as far as being the females? first Royal Rumble match. Right. So it's like, I, did, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And it was like, mind blowing to me that we even had to fight so hard for it. But it was also, we've been fighting this whole time in the business, Lisa, you know, like we had to fight for everything and thank God for our fit and for, and for you people who advocated for female wrestling and like yeah. really saw that women were more than just, I love women as eye candy too. I've always said like those managerial roles and and the girlfriend roles made the female wrestlers so special you know what i mean but now that you know that for a while that line got blurred and it just expected all the girls to know how to wrestle or kind of wrestle good enough to have a decent a good enough match and that's right. you know and so that kind of shift has changed but we don't really have a lot of those girls that don't wrestle anymore except for strictly like behind the camera kind of thing yeah, you're right. And uh, what were some of the gimmick matches? I mean, I know the evening gown. Gravy the Bowl? <laughs> the oh, what? I can list them all. I can list them all. We're talking Jello. We're talking gravy. We're talking lingerie. We're talking evening gown. I love an evening gown match. Pillow fight. Uh, but, but, you know, it's funny. because what? what else? What else? Pillow fight. Yeah. The yeah. Pillow fight. Oh, yeah. Oh, the water yeah. guns. Do you remember the bikini, the water gun fight, the water fight? <laughs> can I just say, I hated those. 
And when we would, we would come to the show, we're like, um, did you bring lingerie? And we're like, yeah, okay, good. We're, we're having a lingerie match, but we're like going like, let's do this cutoff spot where I'm about to chop off your head because they'll forget that we're in lingerie. Yeah. And, okay, we hated these. We hated the gimmick matches, but what do you, you do? You know what else I would do? <laughs> actors don't say, actors, like, go, don't go into a movie and go, I don't want to die at the end. Yeah. I don't want to die. But what you we know, always talk don't about do that. the show is because it's, it's, it's funny because we, we love the dynamic of the fact that, you know, I, I was such a fan of the diva era. And then I love that stuff. I yes. loved it. But I've, I've got two of the most famous, I mean, I'm talking like Mount Rushmore of women's wrestling on this show. And I loved the women's wrestling when it got serious as well. But what I miss about it, I kind of miss that it was like a little bit of both. So I loved like, you know, Trish was a great manager and she was in these sexy roles. But then when she transitioned into a wrestler, it was really exciting. We had Lita, who was always very serious. But then we had like the Terries and the Cats and things like that. So I, I honestly, what I miss about it is I just miss a little bit of the variety. I kind of wish there was a little bit of both. It went, I, 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 get, I, I agree. Guys. Yeah, I, for sure. I'm going to tune in right there. I do. I do miss that too. I, I, I do miss the, variety. the sexiness. Like the Tori and the Candaces and the... Yeah. I yeah, will yeah, say, though, Lisa, I wanted to add to... Oh, I hated doing those. And they would say, oh, do you have lingerie? I would always, at, at probably nine times out of ten, be like, ooh, I didn't bring it. I think you guys might want to send a runner. <laughs> Get us some <laughs> options. <laughs> Every time. I was like, damn it. Yeah, oh, but I get a new bikini. You know, I wish one of the guys, though, Mick, like, like you guys, would have, like, said, mocked us by doing something like that and doing serious oh, mankini like, like, Would you have done a mankini match? Hey, look at like, mankind, mankini. No, I, I go Fish. back, and I was a senior in high school, and I think I, I remember deliberately thinking to myself when it came time to swim laps for the town lifeguard test that, I didn't particularly want to wear the town bikini. Uh, so my brother was a town guard and he got paid more and they'd have one hour on, one hour off. I would sit for eight hours a day at a tennis club in a chair without any breaks, but I got to wear long shorts, you know, and now they, but no, even when I was, you know, relatively swell, felt, you know, 210 pounds, I was never cut out for the mankini. And uh, no, I would have fought that. I would, I, yeah, I would have, and, and as I, I realized as I got older in wrestling, the more I covered up my body, the better I did, right? So when I wrestled, uh, with, there's a, I think I only wrestled three or four matches without a shirt, WWE enhancement matches, and then I went with the Tarzan singlet, then I went with the Butcher singlet, and I did okay in the Butcher, but once I covered up the body and started wearing like the modified uh, t-shirt, my, I'll, here, let me break out one. I found one that my wife made for me in 1991. Hold on a second. Just talk the most. Say, if he's going to put this on, yeah, we'll get a photo of it. Can I, can I tell you, like when you're more covered up, you're less likely to be self-conscious. Like if I bend over this way, my fat roll is not going to go over my shorts. Mm. So the more confident you feel wrestling, you're more focused on the freaking mat, the match, than going, yeah. oh my God, my stomach. Oh God, my butt is jiggling. Yeah. Oh no. Pulling yeah. up the, this is uh, my wife. I remember it. that. Got a lot of wear and tear on it. Oh. And yeah, for me, I wasn't worried about what I looked like. And then when I went with a, 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 like a singlet that went all the way up, I don't know if unisex is the, the right word for it, but it wasn't a singlet with a pair of tights over it. It was one piece. Now I didn't have to worry about my stuff falling down. Nothing's worse than when, you know, I mean, I guess there are things worse, but you know what I'm saying? When someone takes a bump, they're supposed to be selling, they're pulling up their tights. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, you, you wrestle with what you're comfortable with. Um, right. And I was more comfortable with a lot of stuff on. Well, at least you I gave us a say with the girls. outfits. That's good. You gave us a nice variety of outfits to choose from. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like, Mick, Mick, I was telling the girls, like, it's, it's great being covered up because you're not worrying, am I falling out? Is my, my, my tummy going over the tights on the bottom? Um, you're, you're selling the move instead of worrying about all this other stuff. It's, it's, right. I think people should dress as they're comfortable. You're right. But that's, that wasn't our generation. You still dress little bit sexy. I'm thinking about looking into a onesie. I don't know. I yeah, I feel very yeah, sexy. I'm onesie. Just <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mickey, are sexy though. Can I bring up an angle? I think you and I have talked about this before. 
but it was a controversial angle because you were being bullied um, by uh, uh, Michelle and Layla. And, and Layla. And they're like, well, they're promoting bullying. And I, I was like, but this is, but this is real life. And this is, this is an anti-bullying angle. Like right. if we don't do anything mean towards each other, we don't have much of a show. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's something to be said for the handshake and the clean wrestling match. Uh, but I was so drawn in by that angle, uh, maybe because I was somebody who'd been uh, made fun of a lot, you know, growing up, especially, uh, you know, you later come to embrace the way you look. And even yeah. if you don't want the audience to see too much of it, you're still kind of proud of being a bigger guy. But yeah. when I was a kid, you know, I got terribly, uh, you know, humiliated for my size. And I thought it was an angle that really resonated. And I think at one point you were crying, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, and and then in the end, the the women got their uh, literally their justice. Yeah, right. they got their confidence. And did they end up with their faces in cake? They sure was, did. They, <laughs> they they sure did wear but, all the cake. All oh, thanks, I, Mick. I, I just remember. also heard Michelle say something about this. I guess she was doing a thing about that angle, and she put this angle over recently too. So it was. I don't. I couldn't understand people who had a problem with it because it was showcasing bullying because I thought these are two, I mean, they did a great job as heels. Um, they did a really good job pulling that off where they weren't like yeah. the level heels. Like they were really, you know, they were really brutal uh, in their, you know, verbal beatdown of you. And I just thought this is, and you're on your own, you know, one woman against two women mm -hmm. and, uh, and trying, try trying to fight this battle. And I thought, again, when there's so much that goes around when you remember something all those years later. Did you ever hear the, this switch? Did you ever hear Le why Layla was afraid of me? No. no. What? what? Story? <laughs> no. No. Ever. You know, I'm so flattered that you think I'm one of the nicer people you've met in wrestling. For years, she what? would go, no, you don't, you don't know him. I have seen him. And what she saw was me taking issue with Mr. McMahon cursing at me over the headsets. And I guess she was in gorilla position. And I oh. came up like maybe the week before I left and I had my finger in Vince's face. And I said, I don't care who you are. I don't care how much money you have. You will never talk to me that way again. Yeah. Got it, got got. And I, <laughs> I, I remember thinking to myself when I was at the table, I was like, why am I still sitting here? Like, why am I not just walking out on live TV? Because yeah. that's not anybody should be talked to. And, you know, I think Vince has calmed down a little bit. And I was told after the fact, like, uh, that the problem I had is I took it personally. And you're not supposed to take it personally. Yeah. But I yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff personally. And uh, so that was what Layla saw, me and Vince's face storming out. And I think because I left the company like a week later uh, or two weeks later, I think I gave my notice and left, uh, that she didn't ever see me again but she was terrified of that encounter. That was her one encounter? I, oh, I mean, I'd seen her around. And I that was her last encounter, impressionable her, encounter. The last, yeah. the last, yeah. Uh, voicing my displeasure <laughs> with a man's producing style. He was a little I'll too- I'll be honest with you, I would love to see that, that <laughs> side of you because we always see the nice Mick Foley mm -hmm. backstage and that catering and all that stuff. And so- I, I personally- would have loved to see that for so many reasons. Well, you just know what? You guys aren't gonna believe it. The... You guys aren't gonna believe this. You know we love a cutaway. We've got the footage right here. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? I uh, know. Uh, wouldn't surprise me now they film everything backstage, right? <laughs> yeah, with a cell phone. Sure, deep down, he respects you so much for that because you have to Vince does, even though he probably didn't like it in the moment, he does appreciate guts and gusto because not a lot of people have it. Like a lot of people just would never say anything. Uh, well, thanks. I, it was a year and a half until we talked again. Uh, <laughs> and um, I remember getting a message and he was telling me about Luna Vachon passing away. And he was like, I knew you don't like me, but I know you love this company. And so I called him up and I said, hey, Vince McFoley, I, said, I like you. And then we had a nice talk. And one of the things I remember talking about was that we were in, I don't know if we were all in TNA at the, t you know, I know we were there all at the same time. I don't remember for a fact if you were there when I had this conversation, but I think they were having two um, 
uh, Elimination Chamber matches. And I was looking, I was like, geez, what, there's like four out of the 20 people are what I would call marquee stars. They were a little low on marquee talent at that time. And here at TNA, we had all these household names, but what WWE had the advantage, they were like the Jello brand flavored gelatin. Like right. they're so omnipresent. You don't even acknowledge that Knox makes a pretty good gelatin, you know, like right. it's really hard. It doesn't matter how many people we had. We just didn't have that machine, but right. it was Lisa and we had you Mickey and then we had you know Booker and Kevin Nash and me and Scott Steiner and Kurt Angle guys that you know one Rick after another. Ric Flair came. Like, yeah all the and the Hardy and Sting right like we had uh we had a pretty impressive lineup and we just could but I you know there were people and you probably heard fans almost say this like the feeling is like, all right, we know you're there. We appreciate that. But we like you here. Mm -hmm. And we'll be back here, meaning WWE. Like, when you come back, we'll be here waiting for you. You know, yeah. so it, there's not, you know, there are people who sample everything. When I was a super fan, I used to try to watch everything, including AWA, which was tough. Is that, you know, compared to the other shows, it just lacked that spark. And it was on for two hours, mostly enhancement matches. This is, you know, middle mid-80s. Um, but there are a lot of people who only like WWE or only like AEW or only like anything but WWE, you know, they're yeah. indie fans, uh, and there's a, there's a crossover, but absolutely some people just pick their sides and stay with it. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. true. I will say that there are, like you said, there are super fans that are super hardcore, whatever brand that is that they brand it themselves on. But there was a, a genuine amount of people, I think, because I got to do something completely different when I went to TNA as the hardcore country character that said, like, even like that, some, that run was one of their favorite runs and that character and the matches with like Tara or Madison were some of their favorite matches and, and storylines of what I've done, which I found super interesting because I'm like, oh, I was just, you know, getting to throw the music a, in with it like and to get to be just more me and not yeah, have to Mickey, be like we had a lot of input, like at TNA, a lot of lot more freedom and yeah. input that we were not used to. You know what I mean? Yeah. That we were like going, oh wait, how many minutes do I have in this match? You just feel it. And I'm like, wait, hold on. I'm used to being guided by saying I have a five minute match. Um, with entrances. Wait, mm -hmm. Right? Like, with entrances. Yeah. It's just, I don't know what to do with this much freedom. I was, like, clueless. I needed Fit Finley on my side. I needed him to say, do this, start this, like, get this in. Like, you know, I just, I needed that. I wasn't, I wasn't used to being so free. And then you really flourished. And they gave you the time, right? And did, was it yeah. the two of you, the stage match? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. to me a TV show, you know, I don't think TNA gets enough credit for their contribution I agree. to women's wrestling, you know, and what Kim yeah. did and what uh, Awesome Kong did to kind of set the bar really high. I remember, uh, for example, Al Snow, when he was in charge of OVW, when they would ask him what woman was he ready. Still, he still mocks you to this day <laughs> about money, about money, about money. I hear so many stories about that. That's also a great memory about hearing Al Snow's stories about you. <laughs> uh, well, I tell stories about Al Snow too. Um, uh, you know, I, when I would do my one man show, uh, it was always important for me to try to like at least win over the non fans. And the way I would identify them is I would start out, I don't tell jokes at my show, but I would say like, all right, I don't tell jokes. I don't, for example, say, and then I would tell a joke that I'm giving an example of a joke I'm not going to tell what is the difference between Al Snow and the 100 Years War? And the answer is, at a certain point, the 100 Years War was over, right? <laughs> I would quickly look out at the audience because almost everybody would be laughing because you have to speak, wrestle speak to know what that means. Yeah, you know? bingo, yes. bingo, yes. yes. Oh. Again, and when I saw anyone looking like this or like talking <laughs> yeah. to whatever was, like, they're not wrestling fans. And by the end of this show, you might only be able to see four rows of people. By the end of this show, I'm going to see if I can't make them laugh and uh, enjoy themselves. Yeah. Did okay. you smart them up on that joke, though? Like, when you did the joke, you're like, over means... Like, no, no. Yeah, I, yeah I, I might say that. I would, say, I would then oh. say, you're not, you're not a wrestling fan because you would need to know that over meant 
popular, which Mr. Snow most definitely was not. <laughs> <laughs> At oh, but anyway, back to Alan, the women. Every time he was asked by WWE, okay, you know, who's, you know, I, what's the next woman? He'd say, ODB. And, he, and they would say, no, we're not interested. And at that, imagine if ODB had come in, at, you know. To, she would have been a star. I still a can't wrap my head around a rock right. star, a rock She star. is a star. I don't get it, Mick. I know, I know. And so last year when she had the, the truck, you know, the fire. Fire. So we, uh, <clears throat> I got involved and helped out. And she came out to <clears throat> one of my events and we were able to raise some money for her because one of the, the difficult things I think all of us go through is trying to figure out what makes us feel as good as we did when we were in the ring. Yeah. And, and it's really a struggle, right? I mean, it's a challenge. Yeah, yeah, totally. right. Who got in because you thought you could make money in the business. And then it's not, you're not emotionally connected in the same way. But for a lot of us, you know, just, wow, that's the highlight. Now we need something that makes us feel that way right. in some way perform so if you've seen odb at her truck like she's in her element you know she's oh putting gosh. in six hour days but she's a one-man band she's preparing the food she's you know making it she's serving it she's coming out she's taking photos she's meeting and greeting it's like uh you know it's an it's it's a it's an event and right. to see it sidelined and to know that we as a wrestling community could make that difference felt like something i had to get involved in but again, there was this cutting edge character that WWE just wasn't interested in. And she got super over within the context of TNA, but could have been a worldwide star if they just, you know, opened their eyes up a little bit. And thankfully they did. Over time they did, but it was a long time coming. Yeah. And that's why I get a lot of like kudos to you, like Mick. Um, like I, I talk to ODB every day, every you do. day. I do every day. Um, we we we're there's this app called Boxer. It's an audio message. Um, gotta get you app. on Boxer, Mick. Yeah, we gotta get you on Boxer. It's a walkie-talkie. You just press it, and I just talk. Hey, ODB. Um, okay, be safe on your trap. She's moving to Florida right now, and she okay. just called me like, you know, hey, oh my God, it's snowing five inches, that kind of thing. But I, I talk to her every single day, and that girl is such a freaking hard worker. And yeah. How much hours she puts in this food trucking and just like and it, to say a lot about you it's like you you believe in a lot of people that aren't like necessarily like the eye candy of what the businesses are going after you know the big companies yeah. are going after but you you can see the the gem like i mean i i would have been rough yeah. Driving her rough. That's I always exactly. say, I don't understand why Jess doesn't have her own TV show on the Food Network. With she, her food she has truck. tried. I she don't has tried. Understand why she, she, to me, is a star on every level. She's totally, funny. Totally. She's a hard worker. She's humble. She's super sweet. I love and it. Yeah. I love Jess as a human being. I've seen her from the yeah. food truck from when she first started with the baby food truck all the way up to this one, which I think, Mick, didn't you guys end up, well, I think she had to end up, it was a long battle with her insurance company and everything, yeah. but also she had oh. to raise, and now her truck, the truck she had before was just like, you know, a, a smaller food truck that she had kind of converted or whatever. This yeah. one is complete custom, beautiful. And bless you for doing that. Truck. Truck. I remember seeing that. Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, I love you so much, Mick. We yeah, love yeah, you so much. We love you so much. We love you, we really, right, like we, Serious, you're a great, great friend. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, oh, of course. Like, do you want to plug your charities? Do you want to plug any charities? Like, what we, what sure. should do to um, follow all you? Um, you know, I think everyone, if they want to make a difference, they should follow their own heart as to where they can make that difference. But I'm collecting money for Christmas magic this month uh, or in, in uh, November and October. It's still going on. Um, uh, the Wounded Warriors. Uh, last month was America's Vet Dogs, where you, they help uh, place returning veterans with service animals. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to make a difference every month. Um, if people want to check me out, it's Real Mick Foley on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, I'm not on Instagram much, but it's on there. And they can check me out at Cameo, cameo.com slash Mick Foley. And I just, I think they're, I think they're really cool gifts, right? I, yeah. I mean, no, they're people, wonderful and special and I try to put extra into it and uh, I'm you know Mickey maybe you guys can talk this among yourselves like I love the idea that I just do these these letters 
as gifts for friends. Um, but you know, maybe there's someone out there who might like something like that for their child. And I'm thinking about doing some letters and donating all the money to charity or might be able to raise another five or 10 grand and, you know, not forcing anything on anyone, but saying, Hey, if this is something you want, it's time consuming. That's why it's expensive, right. but it's a, something you'll probably, tre- you know, might likely treasure mean more to the parents than it does to the child. And then when the child gets to be of a certain age, you go, okay. Let's have that talk about Santa, but guess yeah. who wrote What talk? You know? Are you talking about what? Yeah, Mickey uh, doesn't no, know no yet. talk to be had ever at any point, yeah. <laughs> but talk. no, honestly, Mickey, you, you, you make such a difference in everyone's lives, and you're so charitable. We love you for the person that you are. You've made a difference in our lives. So we want to raise the class to our fabulous guest, Mick Foley. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. got my Santa's <laughs> village cup. <right? laughs> oh, nice. We so, love you, Mick. We I love, love you. Love you. Have Good a wonderful out. day. Right, Thank bye-bye. you. The ultimate grown ass man. Thanks for being here, Mick. Absolutely. Bye. Absolutely. Bye. All right. Bye. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Have a nice day, she says. <laughs> this is the word to go, yo, yo, yo.